So I have just started recording. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. It's a pleasure to welcome you um, all in this virtual uh, event and to host uh, Professor Muhammad Sabih Anwar from Lahore University of Management, Scientist, uh, uh, Management uh, Sciences in Lahore, uh, Pakistan, to deliver this uh, motivational uh, talk about uh, single photon experiments that have been uh, elaborated and developed uh, in this lab uh, at LAMS uh, University. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like uh, to share with you a few slides um, introducing the subject of uh, the main theme of the lecture and also a few words uh, about, uh, about our distinguished uh, speaker. First of all, uh, thanks to, to Lambda Physics Group, the group uh, of physics uh, lovers at the physics department, the University of Jordan, for helping uh, in making this um, virtual uh, event uh, a reality. Uh, and uh, also for their efforts in the subsequent uh, events that would be announced uh, one by one in the near future. Also, I thank uh, the University of Jordan to make uh, this uh, tool, Microsoft Teams, uh, a possible tool through uh, Microsoft for University of Jordan uh, students and teachers, not only uh, to enable uh, hybrid and online uh, classes, but also to enable uh, hosting guests from uh, outside uh, the institute to uh, hold um, uh, other activities, not only uh, classes and uh, lectures. This event uh, is simply in the occasion of the worldwide celebration of the International Day of Light for the year uh, 2022. The International Day of Light marks the date 16th of May, but uh, the overall uh, year can host events uh, in this occasion. Here at the University of Jordan, Lambda Physics Group is used uh, to celebrate uh, the theme of the International Day of Light uh, by series of events under the title Light Up with Physics, or in Arabic, Ashriq Bil Fizya. This Light Up with Physics started years ago in 2015, then it uh, continued over the years, except in the period of COVID, where, uh, of COVID uh, pandemic, where there was um, uh, let's say a gap in light up with physics. Now this year in 2022, under the umbrella of light up three, the first event will be this uh, motivational talk uh, delivered by uh, Professor Muhammad Sabih Anwar uh, from LAMS uh, University. Now the title of the talk is single photon experiments everyone can do in a physics uh, department. How simple is the idea that everyone can do in a physics department. As you can see from the title, it um, uh, combines two, uh, two uh, main fields in physics. Optics, one of the oldest branches in physics, and the quantum mechanics, which is one of the uh, modern topics, relatively modern topics in physics. So this experiment or this kind of experiment combines optics with the quantum mechanics and optics is well known as a practical branch of physics and quantum mechanics unfortunately is well known or misunderstood as a robust or abstract uh, field in physics and in this lecture the speaker um, i think will uh, co uh, convince you that this is not true quantum mechanics is as practical as optics and other fields of applied uh, physics. Now, why to talk about uh, single photon uh, experiment and uh, and its role in um, um, introducing fundamentals of a quantum mechanics? Um, probably most of you who studied quantum mechanics courses remember the a famous quote of Niels Bohr when he said, "If." Uh, you are not shocked with the quantum mechanics, probably you have not understood it. Or those who are not, who were not shocked with the quantum mechanics, it means that they have not understood quantum mechanics enough. And also Einstein said about quantum mechanics, the quantum mechanical theory, it's either wrong 
or incomplete. Although quantum mechanics is well known as the theory that um, has an explanation to almost every part in our life, at least for atomic systems and then for the macro world, it's also known, unfortunately, and this has been made as a fact among the students and sometimes among teachers, that quantum mechanics is an abstract field of physics. The single photon laboratory is an idea or an initiative to show that quantum mechanics fundamentals can be simply introduced using optical setups in a simple lab, like Phys Lab in Pakistan or Physics Department in any other uh, university. Now, why to host Dr. Sabih Anwar to talk about this topic? For one reason, he's one of the co-authors of a book that was published by United Kingdom, Kingdom in the, by the Institute of Physics in 2019 about quantum mechanics in the single photon laboratory. And this book was authored by Dr. Muhammad Sabih as a leading author and two of his students, Muhammad Hamza Wasim and Faizan Ilahi. And the idea of this book came out from uh, the work that they did during a course about quantum mechanics in the single photon laboratory. So they introduced their experience in this field. And I passed through parts of this book. They don't claim that they are the first in the world to do this, but I would say they are the pioneers in the region to do this, and for sure in Pakistan to do this for the first time. There are other examples of a quantum or single photon quantum mechanical laboratories in the world, but they are the first leading example in Pakistan and in the region. Few lines about the speaker. Now that was briefly about the idea of the lecture. The speaker, Professor Mohammed Sabih Anwar, started uh, his uh, education in physics as a PhD student in Oxford University. And then he spent uh, a postdoc uh, period um, at the University of California in Berkeley. A person with those two kinds of education would have found uh, many opportunities to join for uh, a well-established career in US or Europe but he decided to go back to his home country, Pakistan, because he believes in the human of this country to be pioneers in physics and science. And his goal was, and still, to popularize physics and science among the community of Pakistan and also in the Muslim world. In addition to this uh, nice picture that I found uh, on the internet for Dr. Sabih while he's smiling, I, by chance, found another serious picture, but I, I would like to show it uh, and to highlight it more than the previous one. I hope you all see what I'm presenting. Do you see my screen? Do you hear me? Yes, we see it. Yes, okay, so I continue. So I prefer to, to put this serious picture uh, for a reason. I don't know if any of my students would uh, recognize why I put this uh, photo that I just found today by chance while I was looking uh, for uh, a personal portrait of Dr. Sabih to put it in my presentation. Can anyone tell why this serious picture uh, is um, dear to me, let's say, to put it in the presentation? None? Okay, I would say. If, if you if you notice, not not on the portrait of Dr. Sabih, but look here at the office. You don't see something related to the University of Jordan. Can you see? Yes, the this logo. is the logo of the University of Jordan because the University of Jordan was honored to uh, host Dr. Sabih previously in person before COVID in 2017. So this is the story behind uh, this photo from Dr. Sabih Anwar. Only today I, I, I found it uh, through the internet, so I decided to post it uh, here. And I you would say that live we live. have... Yes, yeah, Dr. You can Sabih? See it live. You can see it live. What? You can see my video. You can see it live again. 
Ah, okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> so I would like to say that we have a, a, a prolonged collaboration with Dr. Sabih in terms of science activities and popularization of science. The first one was in 2016, when I managed to visit Lahore University of Management Scientist, uh, Sciences uh, in Pakistan with a group of my students. And the second chance was in 2017, where this picture can tell you the story that we hosted uh, the professor, Dr. Sabih, uh, to deliver a motivational talk like what we are doing today. But unfortunately, now we are forced to do it uh, virtually. Or also, fortunately, that you are able to do it virtually because he's in a place, I am in another uh, place, and the, the audience are in different uh, places. And by this, uh, I would uh, conclude this brief introduction, thanking again uh, Lambda member, uh, Lambda Physics Group at the University of Jordan, the active list of uh, the current members, uh, uh, Ruba Hassan, Ragad uh, Abu Abdun, uh, Tuqa Umari, Waduha, uh, and Duha Suradi uh, from the Department of Physics. Also, I would also welcome uh, the audience uh, from the University of Jordan uh, undergraduate students, postgraduate students, and ex-students who are currently doing their master or PhD or uh, having uh, a career uh, abroad in Europe or in uh, America. Also, I would uh, like to mention that we, uh, that we are most uh, glad to welcome our friends and colleagues who also uh, joined uh, the meeting from uh, Egypt, from Libya, from USA, from Pakistan, uh, from uh, Nigeria. Uh, that's all that uh, I would remember uh, now. Uh, I trust that you will uh, like this motivational uh, talk. And I would say uh, when uh, I host Dr. Sabih Anwar as a brilliant speaker, uh, I do this because he is uh, well known in this field by his pioneering work in his lab, but also because uh, I consider him as a model, as a mentor, scientist, physicist, educator, and also as a physics teacher. It's a pleasure to welcome you again, Dr. Sabih, and I hope one day we will welcome you once more in person at the University uh, of Jordan. I stop by this and I give you uh, the mic to start uh, your uh, presentation. Yes, Dr. Sabih. Yes, just a minute. I'm going to start. Uh... Yes. <laughs> Right. Uh, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim uh, and Assalamu Alaikum. Wa alaikum. Uh, so first of all, I would like to thank you all, especially Dr. Hanan Saada, for such uh, a nice introduction. Uh, I have known Dr. Hanan Saada for several years now, and uh, it it seems that we've developed uh, a, a very a uh, good relationship uh, between us uh, for a common cause. And that common cause is education, physics, uh, and, and, and science. So I would really like to thank Dr. Hanan Saada for giving me this opportunity and all the students at the Department of Physics in the University of Jordan, which I visited. Some of their students have also come and see us, uh, have come to visit us in Lahore. So I have very fond memories of my interactions with our Jordanian friends. Uh, so I really like the title uh, and the logo by which you are celebrating the International uh, Day of Light, Ashriq Bizya, to, to use light to illuminate, illuminate. And I think it's illuminating not only our surroundings, not only the places and the habitats we, we live, but I think physics and science and an appreciation of the universe can also put a light in in our souls, in our ruh, in, in, in us, so that we can think about our universe in a more illuminated fashion. Uh, so 
I, I really like the theme uh, and I really like the way in which Dr. Hanan Saada claims that this is going to be a motivational talk because I think one of the purposes of the Lambda Physics Society is to motivate youngsters uh, about, about physics and about science. So before I start my presentation formally, I just wanted to ask if you can hear me properly. Yes, we can. All right, okay. So today I would like to go uh, Dr. Sabir, about... yes. uh, we hear you uh, co uh, correctly, but uh, I am wondering whether they can see you properly. Because for me, I don't see you well. The, the, your picture is frozen. Maybe the problem is uh, at my connection. Do you see the speaker uh, properly? It's not only the laggy. screen. It's a bit laggy, but not frozen. A bit lagging, right. but not frozen. Okay. Okay. All right. So let, let me continue. If there is some problem, uh, someone just uh, let me know. So okay. today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, quantum mechanics and optics together. So it's, we generally think that quantum mechanics is something that is only found in textbooks. It's locked up in a prison and it does not find applications anywhere. But Quantum mechanics really has lots and lots of applications in our, even our daily lives now. Consider a laser. You all know that a laser is light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. It's a beam of photons coming out and those photons are in a unified quantum state. All of those photons, which are bosons, they can be described by a singular quantum wave function. So a laser cannot be described without resorting to quantum mechanics. Another phenomenon that you might have come across is magnetic resonance. So if God forbid you have to go to a hospital due to some injury and the doctor advises you an MRI scan, which is a magnetic resonance imaging scan, this scan can only be described by quantum mechanics because the scan captures the signals from the spins of protons or hydrogen nuclei inside the human tissue. And these spins can only be described quantum mechanically and they are inside a magnetic field. They are processing with a certain frequency and as they process, they act like processing magnets and they produce an electromagnetic voltage which is captured by your scanner and is displayed on a screen. So, this is quantum mechanics in action. In fact, in the modern world, a new field has emerged and that field is called quantum biology. So examples of quantum mechanics in biological systems are also gaining more and more popularity. One example is how we smell. So we can smell by virtue of quantum mechanical tunneling of phonons. And we can distinguish between different kind of fragrances because of tunneling, which is again a purely quantum mechanical phenomenon. There are birds that migrate from the cold regions in Upper Russia, Siberia and the North Pole and they come to the warmer regions in Africa, in Asia, uh, in, in many other parts of the world, South America. And they find their way, they navigate with the help of magnetic sensors which are really electron spins placed close to the retina of these eyes. So quantum mechanics is not something just for the textbook you read about wave functions, about operators, about projection operators, about the postulates, about time independent perturbation. That's not just all of it. It finds applications everywhere. And one application that we decided to focus on and use this as a tool to lighten up quantum mechanics in a laboratory in a inside a university is using single photons and with these single photons we developed this whole scheme of demonstrating quantum computing or quantum information so in the screen here that is in front of you you can see layouts of different optical experiments these experiments demonstrate one or two facets of quantum information. The quantum information is one sub branch of quantum mechanics. 
which uh, talks about information in a physical sense. So if you have an electron spin, the electron spin is a piece of information. And this information is captured within a physical property, in this case, spin. And you manipulate the spin, which means you are transforming information from one state to another. Exactly similar to what happens inside a computer. So by making information physical, you could do computing by having dynamics of a physical system unfold itself. For example, with the help of Schrodinger's equation, which tells you how quantum mechanical systems evolve in time. So quantum mechanics and quantum information can all be deployed in an optical setting. And that's what we've done. So this experiment, this sequence of experiments was really done by undergraduate students. So here you can see four BS students and there were students from another university, an engineering university who came to my lab which I call Fizz Lab, and they worked with me for a year and developed these experiments. Now, one of these students, Hamza Wasim, has gone to Oxford University for a DPhil. This student, Faizan, he is an MS student with us in LUMS. He was an engineer before becoming an MS student in physics. And unfortunately, I don't know where these two fine ladies are now, but this was the team who developed uh, these experiments. And we also have a laboratory in our Fizz lab, uh, which is called Goshai Ibn Sahal. Ibn Sahal, as you know, was a famous Arab uh, physicist who worked out laws of refraction well before Wilhelm Snell. So we've labeled our optics laboratory uh, in his honor. So I would like to acknowledge all of these people who worked with me in, in developing these experiments. Now these experiments are offered to our students around the year. So here is a glimpse of uh, four students who are working in this laboratory. And this picture is probably one month old. Uh, there is one undergraduate student, Bilal, uh, and uh, three MS students. One is Umair, uh, one is Sabita, and one is Hafsa. All four of these students are working out different quantum mechanical phenomena with the help of optics. So let me describe what these experiments are all about. So uh, in the end, I'll take, I'll take questions. So thank you for your patience about this. So what does a single photon lab look like? So here is a schematic overview. At the top, you can see a schematic overview. So what happens is, uh, Laser light comes in uh, from a very clean, nice, powerful laser source. And it hits a pair of crystals. These crystals are of beta barium borate. And there are two crystals that are packed together. And these crystals are manufactured in a special way. They are single crystals and they are glued together with their optic axes orthogonal to one another. And what happens is when this laser light comes in, the input beam is called a pump beam. It produces two beams that emerge from the other end. Of course, a large portion of the pump beam goes undeflected, but that's not of our concern. Two additional beams are produced. Uh, one is called the idler beam, and the second one is called the signal beam. Now, this is a beam of photons, and so is this path indicating a beam of photons. Now, these photons are present in both the signal and the idler beams, and these photons have a special property, and the property is that they are correlated with one another. And this correlation in quantum mechanical terms is called entanglement. So you get a pair of photons in each down conversion e event, the process of converting the pump beam into a signal and an idler beam is called down conversion. When this down conversion takes place, a pair of photons are produced, a signal photon and an idler photon. And these photons happen to be entangled, which means that their polarizations are correlated with one another. They are produced at the same time. They are coincident. And the angles by which they come out 
they are also correlated. So their momentums, as you know, the propagation of a photon is labeled by a vector called K, the K vector. And the K vector tells you how much the energy of the photon is, and it tells you the path that the photon is taking. So their momentums are also correlated. And of course, the energies are also correlated. So if you have a photon of a certain energy, half of that energy goes into the signal photon and half of the energy goes into the idler photon. Now, when these photons are produced, the signal and the idler, they have to be detected. And they are detected by special detectors, which I've labeled as A, B, and B prime. In one of the paths, I've placed a beam splitter. What the beam splitter does is that it allows a photon to take two paths at the output. Either it, the photon is transmitted or the photon is reflected. But it can't be reflected and transmitted at the same time. But because, as you know, that the photon is a, a fundamental particle, it cannot be split by any linear process. So, so these single photons, when they hit these detectors, an electronic pulse is produced. So these are special detectors that are called single photon detectors. And they are they have the ability to resolve single photons. So when a single photon comes in, it produces a single electronic pulse. And that electronic pulse then goes on into an electronic circuit, which we've developed and designed. And it's implemented on a particular machinery that is called FPGA, Field Programmable Gate Array. So the field programmable gate array has a property that it can count these pulses from A, B, B prime. If we had other detectors, it could count the pulses from other detectors. It can also do coincidence detection, which means it can tell whether a pulse arrives at A and B at the same time, whether it arrives at A and B prime at the same time, whether it arrives at A, B and B prime at the same time. So you can do all kinds of detections. You could count the A signal, you could count the B signal, the B prime signal, which means that there is no photon detected on B. You can count coincidences between A and B, A and B prime, A, B and B prime, which means that a signal is detected on A and B at the same time and a signal from B prime is absent. So you could do all kinds of uh, of detections and logic uh, logic and the information is then sent through an interface to a computer that runs a particular program such as LabVIEW or Python. And you can look at the statistics of these photons. Now the point is that is this a single photon process? Yes, it is. So how do we produce these single photons? Now, my question is that when you have a laser with any power, say one milliwatt power, one milliwatt power means that it produces billions and billions of photons in perhaps a second, because one milliwatt is a large power and the energy of a, of a single photon is minuscule. It's HF. So it's HF joules. So if you would like to calculate the number of photons in a one milliwatt pulse, that go through an apparatus in a second, it's going to turn out to be a massive number. So these are not really single photons. However, if you look at the down conversion process, the down conversion process is extremely, extremely inefficient, which means if you have a billion, billion pump photons coming in, <clears throat> the number of photons that are going out into the signal and idler beam would just perhaps be one. So it's a kind of attenuation that is taking place in the signal and the idler beams because of the extreme non-efficiency of the down conversion process. And when this happens, only one photon in the signal beam and one photon in the idler beam passes through the apparatus at one time. And you have to wait a long time before the next photon comes in. And that long time could be of the order of, say, milliseconds you know the speed of light and how long does it take for the photon to pass through the entire experimental setup and that's going to be really small so if photons 
come to the apparatus beyond that time limit you would effectively have a single photon coming in to the apparatus at one point in time one photon comes in it does everything that it has to do in the apparatus and then you wait for the next photon so that's why this is called a single photon experiment and how could you tell whether it's a single photon by coincidence detection so if you detect a photon at a then that would mean a single photon exists in this path in the b path in the other path in the signal path one photon in other words one photon in the idler beam indicate would indicate would herald would signal that there is a photon in the other beam and you do all your experiments in the signal beam whenever it is conditioned and heralded by the presence of a photon in the idler beam so you're working in a certain subspace in a conditioned subspace uh, and when you work in that conditioned subspace you're effectively dealing with single photons and as in quantum mechanics everything is probabilistic and you build probabilities by counting the number of photons that you desire and dividing it by the total number of photons that come into the system the total number of counts so you compute probabilities in that fashion effectively you're looking at the number of counts and you get different kinds of curves so in in the bottom row you, you see these kinds of curves so this is the overall big overarching view of the single photon lab and this is what it looks like this is a schematic diagram of one of the experiments that uses single photons so now this is a rendering of what the schematic looks like so you have a laser of a certain wavelength and we use a blue violet laser 405 nanometers it goes out of the laser it is reflected by a pair of mirrors makes a u turn and this beam of photons which is the pump beam has a certain polarization and i hope you all know what polarization is light has polarization so this could be a horizontal or a vertically polarized photon and this initial element an optical element which is called a half wave plate can rotate the plane of polarization of light so it can convert horizontal to vertical vertical to horizontal or horizontal to any other angle theta say diagonally polarized light so if you rotate this half wave plate so you're rotating the crystal that is in the half wave plate and it rotates the polarization so it's like a unitary operator in quantum mechanics which is rotating the quantum state the quantum state that we're dealing here is the polarization state of a photon so you have photons coming in with a certain polarization and hitting this pair of beta barium borate crystals they are down converting a large part of the beam just goes undeflected and is blocked you don't want to do anything with this this is not your desired uh, uh, beam path however if you look carefully enough there are two paths two white lines that are coming out of this crystal and these are the two signal and the idler beams and there are photons in these paths and these photons are entangled with one another they are correlated in position in momentum in time and if this laser came in with a wavelength of 4 or 5 nano nanometers the signal and the idler beams have doubled the wavelength 810 nanometers or half the frequency because energy has to be conserved momentum has to be conserved and when these photons come out you pass them through irises irises are small pin holes that allow you to collimate the beam and focus the beam then you can do an experiment any experiment that you like and these are the different kinds of experiments that we've designed and you have single photon detectors one detector a just tells you that a single photon exists on the other path and so you can do something useful with it so you do a coincidence detection between detector a and the detectors on the other side and on the other side you have your experimental arrangement you could have an interferometer you could do tomography or whatever experiment you would like to do you put it on the other on the other beam so this is a schematic of 
of uh, how our experiments are built up. Everything is on a table. And there are these posts. You must have some of these optics labs, I'm sure, in your department of physics. Uh, and everything is put on an optical breadboard. This, so you can change the position of these uh, of these optical components. You can rotate them, align them. There are knobs everywhere, so you can precise do precise tuning of the paths that the beams take. And everything is placed on a flat, large table called an optical table. And this is what the real system looks like. So in the real system, here is our laser, the light coming in, the crystal, this yellow uh, tube has dried nitrogen, just keeps the crystals uh, in, a, in a good shape because the crystals can absorb moisture. Here are the white uh, beam paths. And here are the different optical components that you can put in each path or both of the paths. And here are the here is so everything is occurring in free space so the light beams are traveling in open air but after the detectors they so here on so still we don't have the detectors here by the way light is then coupled from the free space into these optic fibers these orange uh, conduits they are optic fibers and all of this goes into these detectors these single photon detectors that are put inside a black box here in this particular case uh, because these are single photon detectors, you don't want to over illuminate them or put too much light on them, otherwise they will burn. Uh, so you keep them in, in opaque conditions and they only look at the light that comes in from uh, the physics experiment and is routed through these optical cables. These black boxes, by the way, here, which have knobs on them, are motor controllers. These control the motors which rotate the different optical elements, the quarter wave plate and the half wave plate that we have in the quantum information experiment that we would like to design. So here is a big zoomed out view of the lab. Everything is on, on an optical table. Uh, here is a view of the laser, the crystal. Here is how the coupling from the free space to the fiber takes place. Here is how we can couple different fibers together. And here are the four detectors. Uh, and everything then goes into a computer. By the way, we also uh, have to do the electronic circuit, which counts the number of photons achieved on the different detectors and everything is built on an FPGA. Our students program this FPGA. This FPGA is programmed in a low level language, such as Verilog. Uh, I'm sure some of the students in the University of Jordan are familiar with these electronic components. Uh, and the signals then go into a computer and we have a lab view uh, environment as well as a Python based environment that can count the number of photons and so on. And what we're trying to do, if we were to measure A, B, the coincidences between A and B, we're really doing an AND gate between the pulses A and the pulses B. And this AND gate is programmed into the FPGA. So this is how the overall scheme of these experiments uh, work. So now I'm going to quickly go through the different experiments. Uh, I've already mentioned how do we produce single photons. A pump beam comes in, a signal and the idler beam goes out. These signal and idler photons, they are polarized and they are entangled with one another. And then they are detected by detectors A and B. And then you have a coincidence detection unit, counting unit. Each pulse that comes from a photon, if you look at this on an oscilloscope, it's a very narrow pulse. The pulse would, could be around 20 nanoseconds with some ringing that follows the real pulse. So you have uh, an electronic circuit that converts this pulse into pure signals which resemble what you see here. These are called TTL logic five, logic level one or five volt signals. All right. So the experiments that we do are about counting the number of photons. So basically light could be of three kinds. The 
most general kind of light that we see in our rooms, in our offices, that is from LEDs or from incandescent bulbs or from the sun. This light is uh, super Poissonian uh, and the light is bunched. Uh, so if you look at the at this graph here and you n is uh, is the number of photons seen in a particular interval of time and pn is the probability of detecting that number of photons in that unit of time so if you look at the green graph here this represents super poissonian light for a super Poissonian light, the spread in N is much larger than the square root of the average. Such a process is called super Poissonian in statistical physics, uh, which means that the time intervals at which the photons are impinging on a certain screen or a detector, they are very varied. They are really spread out. However, if you have a pure classical laser, which does not have any noise, then you would hit the threshold of what is called Poissonian light. Uh, and that Poissonian light is shown by the blue curve. As you can notice that the blue curve has a narrower width than super Poissonian light. And it has a property that the spread or the standard deviation of the number of photons is exactly equal to the square root of the average number of photons that you see in an interval. So a pure laser, which produces classical light, even though the process is quantum mechanical, it produces classical light is Poissonian. But if you have single photons, photons that are coming one after the other with intervals that are spaced apart, in other words, the photons represent an anti-bunched stream of particles, then the spread of these photons will be extremely, extremely narrow. And you would get something that is similar to the red curve shown in the diagram. This red curve represents sub-Poissonian light. And this is a signal, signature of single photons or quantum light. So if you achieve this limit, you would have achieved quantum light or single photons. So in our experiments, we're always counting the number of photons that impinge on our detectors in a, in a fixed interval of time. And all our experimental inferences, all our detection schemes are based upon counts. So counts are the only thing that we measure in, in our experiments. Now, how do we know that this is quantum mechanical? There are different ways of telling that the light that we see is quantum mechanical. One is just looking at the statistics, telling whether the statistics are sub-Poissonian, Poissonian, or super-Poissonian. Uh, if you get sub-Poissonian light, the light would be quantum mechanical. But there are other ways. And one way is to see the particle nature, the grainy, graininess of, of these beams of light. And by graininess, we mean that a photon cannot be split. So if you have a photon coming into the signal beam and you pass it through a polarizing beam splitter, the photon can either be detected at B or at B, B prime. So, but the experiment has to be conditioned on what you see at A. So if dependent on the photons that are seen at A, there will be zero correlation between photons at B and B prime. That is, you will never see a coincidence between photons at B and B prime when a coincident detection has taken place at A, which means that if you construct this fraction, <clears throat> the probability of seeing a photon at A, B and B prime together, normalized by the probability of seeing a photon at A and B, multiplied by probability of seeing photon at a and B prime, if you construct this correlation function, which is called a second order correlation function, the numerator has to be zero, really zero, because you will never see a photon coming in at both B and B prime. So the probability of detecting a photon at both B and B prime 
conditioned upon detecting a photon at A, which really means that detecting three fold coincidences, that probability has to be zero. <coughs> so when we do our experiment and run it for a certain number of times, you observe that the probability turns out to be almost equal to zero at tau equals zero. Tau equals zero means that you're detecting all three events at the same time. So this probability is 0 0.080. It's not really zero because there are some false coincidences because every photon detector has some dark counts as well. And those account for these accidental coincidences. But the number, of course, is far, far less than one. If you have a second order correlation function of one, it shows classical light. But at the same period of time, when the time is zero, this correlation function sharply drops to zero. And this is the quantum mechanical signature of quantum mechanical light. So you would do this experiment in, the, in, in, in a lab and tell whether the light that you're seeing is quantum mechanical or is classical, whether you're seeing single photons or not, whether you're seeing subpersonian statistics or not, and whether you're seeing anti-bunched photons or whether they are bunched. So all of these experiments will tell you about the nature of photons. And then you can also do all kinds of experiments. For example, in this experiment, now we'll have to skip the details. Uh, you can tell, so everything that we're trying to do is looking at the wave function of the photons that are being produced. So this wave function has a form. It can be written in the polarization basis, ket h with some coefficient, ket v with some coefficient, and those coefficients could be complex numbers. Here A is taken to be a real number, B is taken to be a real number, but the complex part is inside this phase phi. So we have three real parameters, A, B, and phi. All three of these are describing this quantum mechanical state psi. And now you can do experiments to tell what the quantum state of this particle is. And how do you do those experiments? You put in different kinds of optical elements. Here you, you use a quarter wave plate and a half wave plate in tandem, one after the other. The half wave plate rotates the polarization state and the quarter wave plate converts linear polarization to circular polarization. And then you do a detection after a polarizing beam splitter. So in one experiment, you have a certain setting of the half wave plates, you measure the counts. In another experiment, you have another setting, you measure the counts. And from this, you construct or reconstruct what the coefficients a, b, and phi look like. And here are our predictions. Here is what comes out from experiments. Very nice correspondence. Then you can do all kinds of nice experiments. You could, there's another method that we've invented, which is called the peanut method. And we have another paper on this, which looks at this, uh, pro this experiment in a more graphical sense. And we can find out if you're optics experts you can tell what the stokes parameters of of the photons are and here you can see these pretty patterns which resemble peanuts that can be formed depending upon what the polarization state of the incoming photon is now one nice experiment is the erasure experiment now i hope everyone knows what quantum mechanical interference is and that the interference experiment of a single photon, according to Feynman, is the epitome of quantum mechanics. All of quantum mechanics, if you want to sum it up, it's inside the interference experiment. So in this interference experiment, you have a photon coming in. Let's first talk about the classical experiment, which means classical light coming in from a laser. It takes two parts after the beam splitter and then recombines at this beam splitter and you have a screen. Now, if these two polarizers are either absent in the two parts or they're at the same angle, you will see an interference pattern as shown in B. Now, these are results from our lab. So in this interference pattern, uh, you see an interference pattern because you really don't know which path the light has taken. You're not doing any detection inside the interferometer. All the detection that you're doing is on the screen after light has propagated through the equipment. 
so you let the photons interfere with one another and see what happens after the apparatus you see interference fringes as shown in b however if you keep these polarizers crossed which means you make one of the polarizers horizontal the other vertical and then if if you have a beam splitter here you can tell by looking at the polarization of this beam which path the photon has taken so when you know the path the photon has taken you cannot see an interference pattern because the path the photon takes and the interference which is a wave property which comes out because of k or the momentum they are mutually incompatible observables you know that delta x delta p the product of these is lower bound by h bar so there's an uncertainty principle if you know the path of the photon you cannot be sure about its momentum and if you're not sure about its momentum you don't know what its k is you don't know what the wavelength is you don't know what uh, it's the wavelength that is causing interference you will not see an interference pattern so this is the interferometer experiment uh, and here what we could do as well is we can change the angle theta so if the angle theta is zero which means that the mutual angle between p1 and p2 is zero you will see interference fringes but as in this condition j they are totally 90 degrees out of phase with one another so these interference fringes become less and less visible less visible and then they just disappear <clears throat> all right so this is the interferometer experiment now the nice thing is something really counterintuitive counterintuitive that is called erasure which means you can put a polarizer p3 after the apparatus and this polarizer can erase the which path information. What does this mean? This means is that if P1 and P2 are mutually crossed, interference should not be observable. However, if P3 is at an angle of 45 degrees, the which path information will be erased which will be deleted and you will recover the interference fringes and that is shown in part b of this folio of this diagram part b shows the erasure of which path information and the nice thing is that even though the photon has passed out of the interferometer you're doing an operation outside the interferometer and it's controlling something that should have happened inside the interferometer in the past so you're doing something in the present which is controlling something that has happened in the past so this is kind of a delayed choice experiment and this and this is one of the counterintuitive feature, features of quantum mechanics and the reason behind this is that the wave function cannot be pinpointed in space it's spread out in space it's like a quantum field so we can do all of this inside our single photon lab just with uh, so there you had two beam splitters here we're using two beam displacement prisms and in between there is a half wave plate so you could do an interferometry experiment and then at the final stage you could put in another polarizer and do erasure of the which path information so everything that you could do classically could also be done quantum mechanically with our single photon quantum interferometer experiment and here are some of the results from the quantum erasure experiment that we do in our lab with single photons uh, the, this graph shows exactly the same behavior as we would see for classical light you change the polarization optic axis of the polarizer p3 you can predict what the visibility of the fringes looks like so here you can see that if the polarizers are crossed the predicted visibility is zero if the p3 is at 45 degree the predicted visibility is maximum and here are measured visibility curves and they do not exactly match but they have the same trend they don't exactly match because we're not dealing with pure quantum mechanical states but mixed states but i think this is beyond the scope of this discussion the second last thing that we could do and i'll just skim through this very uh, quickly is you could test entanglement and test 
the non locality of quantum mechanics by using specialized tests that are called bell's inequalities and the idea of bell's inequalities is that you construct a parameter s and if this number is smaller than 2 you would mean that quantum mechanics is local and it's real uh, and what is s s is the expectation value of joint probabilities so it's this number here and each number is defined by these joint probabilities so it's slightly more complicated but when we do this experiment we obtain an s which violates this inequality which is called the bell's inequality or the chsh inequality which tells us that these states are not only entangled but quantum mechanics is non local and it's non real okay so you have to <clears throat> have a different mindset to understand quantum mechanics and there are different tests of non locality is the hardy's test we performed this hardy's test as well and our experimental results match predictions and uh, they indicate that nature violates local realism there is another test called the friedman's test and it also indicates that nature violates local realism finally we could do a full blown tomography experiment <clears throat> and the result of a tomography experiment is finding the density matrix quantum mechanical states are seldom describable by just these cat psi they very hard to come up with states that are pure that are just describable by wave function generally they are mixed states which are incoherent mixtures of these psi and they are described by an operator which is called the density matrix or a density operator so a quantum state tomography experiment can enables you to find out precisely what the state of the photon is and determine or estimate the density matrix for for these photons so with our experiments we could do all kinds of quantum state tomography so here are results from uh, so we prepare different kinds of states we have a predicted density matrix and this is what we measure we could also do take this to the research realm and do different kinds of uh, magneto optical experiments with single photons so now the world is the limit you could do block uh, evolutions of of the trajectory on a block sphere you could do quantum computing experiments uh, and so on so this is all that i i had to uh, had to share with you Uh, at this point i'll be happy to take questions so thank, thank you thank you dr sabir thank sorry you very to, much sorry to longer no no it's okay we are we are about an hour since the beginning so uh, for the audience anyone is interested to raise a question please raise your hand so we can uh, hear you or you could also write on the chat but if you prefer to say it by yourself you could raise your hand so then uh, unmute and we hear you any questions no or something on the chat uh, there is one okay anas assalamu alaikum doctor wa alaikum assalam Uh, I just want to ask about the crystal that uh, produced two uh, two quantum entangled photons from w one original photon. Uh, what exactly is the mechanism that it utilizes? It's a very nice question. So generally we deal with linear optics. Linear optics means that uh, if light passes through a crystal its frequency does not change. its energy does not change the phase may change because it can be retarded but the frequency or the energy doesn't change but alongside these linear optical effects there are also non linear optical effects one example is second harmonic generation second harmonic generation means you put in a a, a photon of frequency omega and it produces two photons of frequency 2 omega each or it halves the frequencies so it produces two photons of 
omega over 2 each. Now, this process is non-linear and there's a certain probability that this process occurs. Uh, generally, if we have very intense laser beams, does this effect become visible? But in certain crystals, uh, you can still observe this effect uh, of second harmonic generation. And this is what is happening here. Uh, you put in a, a photon of frequency omega, you get two photons of of half the frequency and there's a certain cross section in, in nuclear physics uh, experiments we generally talk about cross sections in optics experiments there are also cross sections which tell you what the wavelength of us what the probability of a certain process is and this can be calculated by means of atomic physics which means you look at the wave function of the incoming photon and the wave function of the two photons of uh, half the frequency and construct uh, what is called an exchange integral. That exchange integral, if you take the modulus square of this, that will give you the cross section of that process. So it's a nonlinear optical process, and there are many nonlinear optical processes. There could be higher order, third order, fourth order, fifth order nonlinear process. So it's a nonlinear optical process. That's why it's so inefficient. Uh, but uh, it does happen, and that's what we are trying to exploit in this experiment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sabih. Thank you, Anas. Who else uh, could ask a question? Maybe they can ask in Arabic and you can translate for me. Of course I can. If they are shy. Uh, I would be surprised if they are shy. After uh, more than two years of uh, virtual classes and hybrid classes. So anyone from the audience, not necessarily from the University of Jordan students, Anyone is interested to raise a question? Okay, until you find the questions, I would ask uh, my own questions. Dr. Sabih, uh, I am wondering how much this uh, quantum or single photon quantum laboratory, uh, how much uh, it costed you at LAMS? Let's say when you started from scratch. Or we could say that you have not started from scratch because you have this lab already. Yes, we did not start from scratch. We took 10 years to build this and we did it incrementally. So over the years, we collected things and we did smaller experiments and everything You mean by was... 10 years about this lab, not about the single photon quantum lab, right? 10 years right. about this lab. The FIS lab is about 12, 13 years old, but very early on we started thinking about these experiments. But then it all uh, started coming true in 2018 when the, we had this group of interesting students. So it's important to, one, I would like to mention the need for students. Okay. You have to have motivated students and they do not have any, you cannot put a price tag on them. They do not have any uh, price tag associated with them. The students are the most valuable thing. And if you can find interested students who can dedicate long hours and dedicate one or two years of their lives for this cause, that's priceless. But if you talk about prices in terms of dollars of the final setup, if you want to build it from scratch, in our book, in fact, we have an inventory. So if anyone would like to build up anywhere in the world, they can just look at our inventory and they can uh, order those equipments and bingo, it will be created for them. But it cost would be around, I think, uh, $10,000 to $15,000. $10,000 perhaps is an upper number starting from the optical table. The most expensive thing are the single photon detectors. So they would cost about three, four $4,000, then two two or $3,000 for the laser. So about $10,000 is an upper limit, I would say. If you have an empty empty room, you don't have anything, an empty room, and you want to have an optical table, an optical breadboard, lasers, detectors, computers, and all kinds of optical elements, $10,000 is the upper limit. Okay. Could be cheaper. Could be cheaper. And uh, did LAMS um, afford all this cost? So ten thousand dollars we spent over ten years. That's what over I want. Over ten to years. Mention. So okay. it was so easy over ten to... years, it's not uh, much. Yes. So it was through lambs and through other grants. 
And another question, of course, I agree with you that it's not uh, only a matter of how much fund you have, but how many motivated students you lead. Because students, when they are motivated, they really could spend their lives just to get this subject or this dream or this kind of lab uh, happen. Um, my question is, what obstacles you met when you returned back home after you finished your uh, education abroad and you started this lab from scratch? And then you managed to do this single photon quantum lab. What obstacles you faced? But that's a very good question. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I faced no obstacles. And the reason is that I do not consider any obstacle an obstacle. An obstacle is an opportunity. I know that in Pakistan, and I'm sure this is true of Jordan as well. I know that uh, the standard of living is not the same. Uh, there is not enough money in our universities. There is uh, very little funding that is available. Our fundamental ed basic education is weaker. So it's hard to get uh, students who are polished before they enter university. You have to polish them inside the university. Uh, we have power outages. There's sometimes no electricity. I, I have to come to my office today. Uh, it's a Saturday. It's uh, it's a holiday, but I have to come to my office from my home because I know in my home there's no electricity at, at some point. So maybe the connection is broken and there's no light and it will be difficult to. So I have to come. To, so problems of this kind always exist. And funding is a, is a major problem. Uh, and you are alone. The, the biggest thing is that you're alone. You will not find any other person who has worked on a similar idea because the critical sizes are too small. We have not yet reached critical sizes. We are very few people. So you are alone. You do not have any one to bounce of ideas where you cannot walk into your neighboring lab and see a similar setup. I started doing optics when I came to Pakistan because it was cheaper than the work that I used to do in Oxford and Berkeley. That was different kind of thing. But since I, when I developed Fizz Lab, I learned all my physics by teaching. I have not done a BS in physics or an MS in physics. Uh, I'm an engineer. Then I did a PhD in physics. In Oxford, there's no coursework. You have to just do research. So I learned all my physics through self-study and through building a lab. When I built this phys lab, I learned all the physics. Do you think I know quantum mechanics? When I, when I did my PhD, uh, probably I knew less quantum mechanics than these students who are sitting here. But when I built these quantum labs, did I learn quantum mechanics? Did I learn about quantum information, about quantum computing? So you have to spend time and you have to sacrifice. Uh, you have to make sacrifice. The biggest sacrifice that you have to make is you have to sacrifice time. Time that you spend perhaps for your family, perhaps for your pleasure. You do not get any time for pleasure or for leisure or for holidays. You just have to do some sacrifices. And that's the, I really love it being in Pakistan and in these conditions because there's so much to do. And uh, I think, uh, Alhamdulillah, I'm very happy with my choice of coming back. Alhamdulillah. So it's not enough only to be motivated. One should be motivated and dedicated also. A motivated student, a passionate student is not enough. If the student have, has the passion, but doesn't have the dedication. So one should sacrifice the, the time, the effort also, as you said. And one thing I would like to add, Dr. Hanan. Yes, please. Is I find for my students here as well in Pakistan, uh, do not look for rewards, early rewards, instant rewards. When you are searching for knowledge, <clears throat> especially physics do not look for research papers or publications or or nice or rewards money. Or, or money or fame or fame <laughs> uh, just keep on working and everything is going to happen and being alone is better than being with a bad companion who can let you down 
<laughs> yes. Your students become your companions. Of course. Trust your students. Your students are the real companions more than your colleagues. I so agree. you have colleagues in your department. They will not be as friends as you can make with your students. Make your students your friends. I agree. My students, any questions? My colleagues. Hatim Our Baba guest, has a nice question. Uh, Hatim, you can. Yes. Hatim, you can unmute yourself if you have a question, or you wrote it. Okay, just a second. <laughs> Uh, okay, Salam. Thank you for the nice talk. This is Hatem. It seems he has a problem with the mic. Thank you for the nice talk. Why do we have two mirrors after the laser source? It is just the space on the optic table. So I, I the question: Why do we have two mirrors, Doctor Zabih, after the laser source? I think this is one of the the first few slides. Yes. Is it just the space on the optic table? He said. Well, uh, it's not just the space. It's a technical question related to the experiment. It's not just the space. Of course, it's due to the space as well. But it's due to the point that you have more points available for alignment. So if you have take a round trip by 180 degrees through two mirrors, you have more points available for, with, with the help of which you can make an alignment. And when you do an al alignment, you want a tight alignment. So what we do is just to do the alignment, we turn off the laser and put a screen in its place. And where we are placing a detector, we put in another laser, a fiber laser. And so we run a beam backwards. So we, when we propagate the beam backwards, if it falls onto the initial uh, opening of the pump laser, which is at, at this point turned off, if it follows the exact same path, then you will have perfect alignment. And you would like to create these 90 degrees edges by the two mirrors so that you have more space to check your alignment. And if your alignment is proper over this 180 degrees turn, it means you have almost a perfect alignment. So the idea is to do a better and better and better alignment. And that's achieved by these two mirrors. I hope I've answered your question. Hatem. Thank you, Dr. Sabih. Yes, more degrees of freedom. Exactly. More degrees of freedom yeah. over which you can do uh, check your alignment because we have a back propagating alignment laser as well, which I did not describe. Okay. Who else? Uh has a question the audience so i would also like to invite students from jordan egypt nigeria anywhere to we have a phd program and you can come and work in these labs and that phd program is totally free in fact, we give a scholarship to our students, a very active program. So if anyone would like to come to our lab, visit us or, or do a master's here or a PhD here, that's also a possibility. And we're going to resume a lab immersion programs very soon. Uh, Dr. Hanan with other students, Sara, uh, and I forget the other names, they came. Sara Amina Islam. Amina was on the list of the audience. I'm not sure if she's still uh, in the list or not. Sara, no, did not join. She's uh, now abroad, I think. Islam also the same. But also there are other Saras in the list. And hopefully they would be interested. Uh, okay, so if there are no more questions from the audience, so this is the last call for anyone who, in, who is interested to, to raise a question or even to, 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 to say a comment about this lecture. I would conclude by a comment that um, as I believe and as we learned from science, 
that science keeps raising questions to us from early history, like you mentioned, Dr. Sabih Ibn Sahib and other pioneers in the world of science and physics. Science keeps raising questions, and these questions over the, the years have been answered either by um, uh, postulates or by visualization, either by uh, hypothesis or uh, by experiment. But I do believe that the final, the most precise answer to all questions that have been raised by science is always concluded by an experiment. Do you agree? And I think quantum mechanics is not an exception. Yes, I fully agree. And probably it's, it's the theme of this lecture that quantum mechanics is not an exception. Answers in, of quantum mechanical questions like entanglement, teleportation is also possible and affordable and applicable to be raised by um, experiment as you did in uh, the single photon uh, uh, laboratory. I, I can see Rand raised her hand. Rand, please unmute yourself, Rand. Hi. Uh, I want to ask about um, the the temperature that uh, you work on. So uh, how uh, you deal with the vibration of the uh, atoms and the crystal? So this is a, everything is at room temperature. And uh, the vibrations on, on the crystal, they do not really show up in, in this experiment because we're not doing a, a, speci a spatial measurement. We're, doing, we're in the polarization degree of freedom. If we were looking at positions and we had a very sharp focus beam, then the vibrations of, of the table or the air currents would, would matter. Of course, the alignment is affected, but really we're dealing with the polarization degree of freedom. And uh, this is a macroscopic crystal this is a macroscopic effect, large scale effect. So the atomic vibrations uh, do not matter here. If we were dealing with say atomic traps or electrons, single electrons, then these effects that you mentioned about atomic vibrations or phonons, they become important, but not at this, uh, at this optical scale. And the good thing about optical experiments is that they can be done at room temperature. Uh, these experiments can be done at room temperature. This kind of quantum computing with single photons does not require superconducting temperatures or cryogenic temperatures. Yeah. By the way, this is a, also technologically important, these experiments for any country, if they were like to do cryptography, long distance communication for uh, security purposes, for e-commerce, uh, these are the test starting point of experiments on quantum key distribution, cryptography, quantum communication, satellite communication. So these are technologically important experiments as well, not just for fun and theory. Anas has Thank a you. question. Thank you, Dr. Sabih. Thank you, Rand. Uh, who else? Who raised his hand, Ruba? Uh, yes, doctor. I would like to say uh, that uh, thank you for thank you, Dr. Hanan, and thank you for Dr. Muhammad uh, Sabih for this valuable lecture. Thank Any you questions? for <laughs> Thank you. Thank no you for questions. Other questions? Anas. Yes, please, Anas. Uh, yes, assalamu alaikum again. Wa I just want to ask uh, Professor Muhammad about uh, the scholarship. He, uh, scholarships he mentioned. Uh, I have two main questions. Uh, is is uh, are they are they only on in uh, quantum optics field, or are they are there other fields that uh, we can apply to? And is a master degree prerequisite for the scholarship, or can one apply to it uh, with only a bachelor's degree? Uh, 
first it's not just in the area of quantum uh, optics you can do other we have 10 faculty members in physics uh, they do different kinds of uh, cosmology material science condensed matter physics particle physics spectroscopy i do other optics stuff as well so it's not just for quantum optics but for a range of uh, topics and uh, i think uh, with a 16 year of education with the bs degree a solid bs degree 16 years of education you can apply yes thanks thank you doctor thank you you can always contact me by email for more information I'm writing my email here. Okay. Okay, there was a question about the scholarship, but you, you have already answered Dr. Sobih, and yes, you bought the email. Okay, who else? Uh, I can see someone raised his hand. Nobody. Anyone else has a question? Okay. If if no more questions before we close and we conclude and thank Dr. Sabih, uh, I would like to ask uh, the audience if they don't mind to open the camera so we could make uh, like um, a group photo. Okay, Anas. Uh, Lambda, Lambda members, please open your camera. Ruba, Duha, Ragad, Tuka. Other guests also. Randall Far, open your camera, please, if you can. Guests from uh, outside the University of Jordan. Former University of Jordan students who are abroad, it would be a chance to, to have a group photo with you all. Do you hear me? Our audience, students. I think they I think they're all in their beds. Yeah, because it's Saturday, you know? It's holiday for them. And this, and this is the mood how they, they attend classes at the <laughs> university. <laughs> After two years of remote learning. Okay, so. Ruba, uh, wh where are Lambda members? Doha, are you around? Tuka. Yeah, they are, they are around, but uh, maybe they are checking the, the camera. Or something Please like. unmute yourself. And anyone is interested to open the camera, please do. Then we could uh, conclude and uh, have a group photo. I don't know, Ruba, can you can you make uh, can we take a group photo from from your uh, side? Okay, I will I will take a photo. Just a minute. Atim Baba writes that he's with his children, with his kids. Uh, Atim <laughs> Baba, yes. Okay, now yeah. I see Ragad. <coughs> I don't know if Hatim is still around. Uh, I will take the photo now. Please smile. Rand. Smile uh, as much as Anas uh, is smiling. <laughs> okay, I will take another one. Okay. And I will take one from my side also. Please uh, smile. Okay. 
And let me check that I've been captured. One more. Smile. That's cool, I think. Okay, unless somebody else joined. Okay, uh, I would just check the chat if there is a note or so. Okay, Rima Lamara. Rima, are you from the University of Jordan? I'm actually from Gaza, Palestine. From? Gaza, Gaza, Palestine. From Gaza, you are most yes. welcome. Thank you. you are most welcome. Which university? Al Azhar. Al Azhar. Physics? Yes. Physics. We are very glad that you managed to join us. Do you uh, have electricity glad. today? <laughs> Fortunately, yes. Alhamdulillah. But you see, you are not alone. <laughs> yeah, I can see. I'm glad to be with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And may Allah free Palestine. Yeah, Rab. Okay. Um, I would uh, conclude by thanking Dr. Uh, Dr. Sabih once more, and uh, I hope next time we will host you in person uh, at Allah. the university, inshallah. And uh, I thank again uh, the university for enabling us to 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 have this uh, tool to to hold uh, such meetings and activities even while we are away or uh, abroad. Uh, also, the University of Jordan students, because they are the majority in this audience, I thank them for their uh, interested for their uh, interest and uh, for the interesting questions that they raised. And uh, by this, uh, I can uh, say thank you for your time. And Dr. Sabih, uh, I know now the time is um, half past nine in Pakistan. So thank you for uh, staying with us all this time and also for accepting this uh, from the beginning. I am very thank grateful. Very I am personally thank grateful. You thank you to all of you and to the, all the students. And uh, shukran lakum. And ma salam. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Wa alaikum salam. Okay, I will stop the recording and end the meeting. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam.